My name is Frank Moncrief. Um, the date is uh, the 10th uh, October 2014, and we're at uh, Sorry about that. National Skydive Museum uh, weekend in Rayford, North Carolina. Um, I'm supposed to rattle on here, I guess. I guess I'll start at the beginning. Uh, I'm, a Navy, I'm a retired Navy SEAL, put uh, 24 years in the Navy, 17 and a half with UDT SEAL team. I was a member of the 1962 Navy parachute team, the Shooting Stars. I started skydiving right after I got out of jump school, Fort Benning, Georgia. So I started skydiving in 1958. Um, what prompted the skydiving was the fact that we enjoyed jumping out of airplanes. Uh, they sent a bunch of uh, frogmen down to Fort Benning, Georgia to go through jump school so that we'd have another way of entering a country if we had to. Um, uh, we did our thing down in Fort Benning, Georgia, and enjoyed jumping out of airplanes, and we found out there was such a thing as skydiving, we thought we'd look into it, and we started skydiving. And I mean, we started skydiving, because there was no such thing as skydiving in the Tidewater area when we started. A friend of mine uh, at quarters one morning, every morning the Navy has what they call quarters, where the crew gets together and the, the powers to be tell us what's going to happen that day. Uh, and my friend McGee said, Frank, guess what I did this weekend? And I said, what was that? He said, I jumped out of my airplane. I said, wow, how? He said, wait till after quarters. After quarters, he took me to, to his car, opened up the trunk, and showed me this orange and white canopy. I said, where'd you get that thing? He says, the Pop the Mechanics magazine. I said, Maggie, I can get a lot of those things. <laughs> I went to Salvage the next day and came back with eight of them. Salvage Navy parachutes. We started jumping... Um, uh, soon after that, I think it was the week or the following week, we started jumping. We were jumping, we knew we had to wear a reserve, so we used an Army reserve. We didn't know how to integrate a D-ring into the harness, so we wore a QAC chest pack, which was a uh, chest pack that a, a bomber crew would wear. If they needed to jump out of the airplane, they'd strap a QAC chest pack on the D-rings, which were on this harness, and exit the airplane with a parachute. Well, we wore the QAC ch chest pack harness and a B-12 backpack harness, both harnesses, so we could snap a reserve on. Now, we weren't too smart in those days, but we were beginning. Um, we were doing delayed jumps. We didn't have altimeters in those days. We hadn't learned how to get steal them yet, I guess is the best word to use. And so we're using stopwatches, and we're jumping with stopwatches. Um, 10-second delays were a big thing. Anything over 10-second delays, 15-second delays. Uh, you could tell uh, by walking around the DZ. At the time, we wore Carpenter's white coveralls. You could tell a man that had been in um, a 10-second delay um, that he'd reached terminal by the fact that he had a red stripe running down the side of his leg. On a, on a hot, sunny day, you perspired a lot. And those harnesses both had buckles on the sides of your hip. Both had buckles on the side of your hip. When you made an opening, and in those days when you made an opening, it was a slam, bang, black and white dots opening. Those buckles came together and pinched you. Consequently, you bled this little red stripe down the side of your jumps. So you could tell an experienced jumper over 10 second delays because of the red stripe down the side of his jumpsuit. Um, we didn't know much about skydiving at the time, but we knew we could fall out of an airplane. And a friend of mine, Lenny Wall, he used to go down to Fort Bragg and jump with the Army guys a lot. And one weekend he brought a guy by the name of Jim Arinder up. Now, everybody in skydiving knows Jim Arinder. He was one hell of a guy. Um, Jim came to our drop zone, which was the South Norfolk Airport. It had two grass runways. And Jim walks out and he says, well, where's your DZ? Now, he's used to jumping down here in Fort Bragg where they have these, these like St. Mary Galice or, or uh, Nijmegen drop zones that are 10 miles long and 5 miles wide. Ours were just two dirt taxiways or runways. We said, there it is, Jim. And he said, well, okay, guys, I'm going to go to altitude. I'm going to jump. I'm going to make a 360 right, a 360 left, a back loop. Then I'm going to pull my ripcord. Well, he did these things. Well, we used to do those things, but we didn't tell anybody about it because we really didn't know what we were going to do when we stepped out of the plane. We used to go through all of those things, but <laughs> actually it was... I called uncontrolled jumps. 
Um, he did this, and he pulled his ripcord, and a piece of his parachute flew off, and then he had a big hole in the back of it. And we thought, oh my God, something's going on. When he landed, we rushed out, I rushed out, I said, Jim, what, 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 what was that? What happened to your parachute? He said, oh, it's oh, my sleeve. What's a sleeve? Well, you pull that down over your parachute to slow down your opening. And, and, and you got a hole. No, that's not a hole. He said, that's for steerability. Well, what do you do? He said, well, you go five feet up from the skirt, cut the material out five feet up from the skirt on Gore 28. He said, then tape it, and that will give you, a, if you pull your riser down on the right, it'll turn right. If you pull it on the left, that's for steerability. Well, that's a good idea. And the sleeve, explain the sleeve. And they explain the sleeve. You fold your parachute, you slide the sleeve down over it, and when it opens up, it has to come out of the sleeve before it can open up, which will slow down the opening. Well, that made sense, too. I was a rigger at the time, so I immediately, after that, started making sleeves. But some of the guys stayed at the airport that night. It was a Saturday night. Sunday morning, <laughs> beautiful Sunday morning, the guys had been up all night modifying their canopies. They were cutting five feet up on Gore 28, taping it with masking tape, not sewing tape on. The next day, it was like... <laughs> They would jump out of the airplane, pull the ripcord, and the parachute would open up, and the gore would be open in front of them or on the side of them because the parachute wasn't put back together with gore 28 in the back. So that was that was it was a lot of fun. Anyhow, we were in the beginning of skydiving in the Tidewater area. We enjoyed every minute of it. I started way back in skydiving in 50 in 58. I, I made my first jump in 56, I believe. That was a, going through Fort Benning, Georgia, and I'm still jumping. Um, and I'm 85 years old, and people say I shouldn't be doing that. Well, I enjoy doing it, so I'm going to continue to do it. And if anybody out there doubts it, try skydiving one time. It is, it's, you, can't, you can't explain it. You have to do it until, in order to understand what I'm talking about. It's enjoyable. It's a lot of fun. A lot of us do it, and we're still doing it. And if I can get anybody out there into a drop zone someplace, I think they should try it. Back when they invented astronauts, they decided that weightlessness in air and weightlessness in water would be about the same thing. So they decided to send their original seven astronauts to uh, Little Creek, Virginia for underwater training. Um, they wanted them to learn how to use scuba gear so they could swim around in weightlessness like they were supposed to think of. Uh, they thought that this was going to be the same as air type weightlessness. Well, I happened to be honored to be one of the instructors for these seven astronauts. They came to Little Creek and we taught them how to use scuba diving gear, uh, scuba gear. Um, but we had to tell everything. In fact, uh, uh, John Glenn, I had to teach him about an, an aquan demand valve. Well, I was an instructor to begin with, so I told him, like I told all of my students, how the valve worked. That wasn't good enough for him. He wanted to know exactly how it worked. I had to take that thing apart completely, every spring, every diaphragm, every screw, and explain the function of everything in that. They were that thorough. Put it back together again. And of course, that's just to tell you how thorough they were. These guys were great. They were the greatest, I thought. Well, anyhow, we put them through pool training. Pool training, of course, is teaching out a guy, a guy how to use an aquilon. At the end of the training period, we have a uh, the ending is like the graduation. We give them a full tank of air, tell them to go down and don't come up for anything. Now remember this part. Then we harass them. We go down and take their fins off, turn their air off, take their mask off. They have to recover all, from all of these little things that we do to them without coming to the surface. Well, these guys are that good. They came, came through this with flying colors and they graduated. And we said our goodbyes and um, I was sad to see the guys go because they were a great bunch of people, a great bunch of men. Um, they left. And I thought, well, that's the end. A couple of weeks later, word came down, does anybody want to fly with an astronaut? So I said, what? They said, yeah, all you got to do is go over to Langley. They're, they're willing to give you, a ride in air, give you a ride in their airplane. I said, well, sure. And myself and two or three other guys went over there. When we got there, it was decided that Gus Grissom was going to be my pilot. They gave me Walter Sherrard's flight suit to wear, and they gave me Deke, Selton, Deke Shelton's helmet to wear. I got in the back of this T-33 with, with Gus, and he said, Frank, do me a favor. He said, put your left hand on your left knee, put your right hand on your right knee, and don't touch a thing. He said, just make believe you're sitting on a toilet. I said, Roger, Gus, exactly. He said, okay, I'm going to take off. I'm going to take this bucket, bucket of, of bowl of 
bucket of something. That he, didn't, they didn't like, he didn't like the plane. It was a T-33. They were used to high-performance aircraft, but the Air Force would only let them fly these things to get their skins, that's their, their money, their, their flight pay. So he said, I'm going to take off. He says, uh, there's a cloud cover about 3,000 feet. He said, I'll fly out, out over the Chesapeake Bay and see if I can find a hole. He said, if not, we'll see what, we, what comes up. So we flew out, out over the Chesapeake Bay and looking for a hole in the clouds. Well, he said, I don't see any holes. He said, I, we better go back to, towards Richmond. He said, that was my flight plan anyhow. And he threw that thing into a bank, and I thought, oh, my God. I never felt anything so heavy pushing down. That helmet weighed two tons. He was, I was pulling G's. I had never done that before. I had never felt that before. So we turned around, and we headed for Richmond. And all of a sudden, he said, there's a hole. So we went from 3,000 feet to 10,000 feet, just like that. To me, that was a fast airplane. We got up at 10,000 feet, and the clouds were like big lava lamp uh, columns all over the place. So he proceeded to, and I have to use my hands here, he proceeded to do one of these things, just flying around these little things and up and down and around and around. And I must have made a sound because he, he said, Frank, you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. He says, don't you throw up in my airplane. I said, Gus, just before I die, I'm going to throw up in your airplane. So we're flying along, and he's flying through all these things. Then he gets level. He's on level flight. He says, well, there's Richmond. And me, my, my big mouth, I says, well, how can you tell from up here? He says, well, let's go take a look. And we went straight down, and he's going side to side, straight down. He pulled that thing out at, I don't know, maybe 3,000 feet. And then he started a whipping back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. He says, are you okay? I said, I'm fine, Gus. He leveled the thing off, and I thought, oh, God. He leveled it off. I felt good. He said, do something. I said, what do you mean? He said, grab the stick. I said, no, 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 you're doing fine. You're, you're flying this plane really great. He said, no, grab the stick. So I grabbed the stick. He says, well, do something. I said, I am doing something. I'm flying your airplane. He says, no, come on, do something. He said, push the stick over the left and pull it back. I push the stick over the left and pull it back, and I'm pulling, geez. And I said, oh, and I straighten the thing back up again. He said, oh, come on, Candy, do something. So I stuck that thing over, and I pulled it back, and I'm feel like I'm going to black out. And I said, Gus, you better take it. And I stuck it back up. And the plane started going away. I said, Gus, he said, I got it. <laughs> well, we got back to Langley and we landed and I was as white as a sheet. I got out of the airplane. We're walking across the tarmac. Gus walked over and he put his arm over my shoulder. He said, Frank, that's my swimming pool. And I said, touche, Gus. <laughs> touche. <laughs> he definitely got me. That's a good story, I think. You could cut that part out. <laughs>